guest today is a professor of anthropology at the University of Oregon. As a paleontologist, he has conducted field research in Eastern Africa over the last three decades, studying the evolution of African monkeys. This conversation centered around human evolution, how we have advanced, and where we are going. I had a great time talking with this guy. Here is my friend, Steve Frost. So, Steve, first, I want to go back in time. I, in preparation for this, started watching a bunch of YouTube videos because I love the ones where they show uh, brief uh, recaps of what has happened and how we got to where we're at. Mm -hmm. And one of the most fascinating ones to me is the, uh, I just looked it up before you got here, the Cretaceous Paleogene Extinction Event mm. with the Chicxulub. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Approximately. I, I don't speak uh, that language, but I think that sounds pretty good. Okay, cool. The The recreations that they do to show that event when the asteroid that I think it was six miles wide. Mm -hmm, something like that. Crashed into the Yucatan mm -hmm. near Mexico and sent tsunamis sky high and just totally decimated the earth. Mm -hmm. It wiped out all the dinosaurs who had been around for 180 million years, some crazy amount of time that, yeah. that we can't even fathom. And the part that's so fascinating to me is that we, according to science, were these tiny little shrews. Yeah, little mammals. Yeah. Little mammals chilling underneath the ground. I don't know about that, but we, I think the idea is that uh, – they would have been in an ecological position that was less vulnerable to what was happening. And the truth is nobody really knows exactly why some things go extinct and some things don't. Yeah, because if you follow that thought process, anything alive now has to have an ancestor, right? Yes. So we, anything that's alive now has supposedly been alive for four or five billion years. Yeah, so I, th I think the the most recent numbers that I've seen are life appears on Earth somewhere near 4 billion years ago. Yeah. Yeah, that is insane. And so from that, from the depths of that tragedy, all of these, these crazy reptiles that had taken over the mm -hmm. planet forever die, and we come out, and then for another 65 million years slowly evolve into what we are now indeed yeah and i think um it's this is this is a i think uh, that's a great place to start because for me it has a lot of important things to think about i mean yeah it's exciting big extraterrestrial impact catastrophe um for me it speaks to many things the resilience of life uh which you know, as a paleontologist, one of the things you learn is that there's a number of large extinction events in evolutionary history. That's not the biggest one, which to me was a kind of a wow moment. Because when you think about like, what could be worse than that? Uh, well, the other axiom is it can always get worse. <laughs> but <laughs> True. Uh, <laughs> well, okay, so. <laughs> but, but my point is, there was another larger extinction, um, one at the, at the um, boundary between the... Um, uh, Permian and Triassic. Okay. And uh, I don't know that the cause is entirely known, but one hypothesis is sort of a mass volcanic event. Um, but nonetheless, my point here is uh, evolution has a lot of these big extinction events. And in fact, uh, geologists divide the history of the earth into a series of periods that are based on the fossils that were found during those periods. And then they decided that, okay, this need this next layer of rock needs to be a new period because the animals and plants are so different, okay? Well, what it turns out is the reason they're so different is there's large extinction <laughs> events between all of these boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the ideas, so if you ask your typical person on the street, what, you know, explain what you learned, what, what is evolution or what's Darwin's, you know, big contribution. But like, oh, survival of the fittest, which Darwin didn't actually say. It's not necessarily. Because at the time that that impact happened, dinosaurs were probably really fit. But a, an event for which no evolutionary adaptation could possibly prepare you 
has occurred and basically wipes out a large chunk of all life on Earth. It was 95%, wasn't it? I don't know the number. And I, I think it might be a little bit less than that. Okay. I think the 95% number comes from the uh, Permo-Triassic extinction that I was talking about before. Okay. Um, but that's going to be a poor estimate anyway. It's based on paleontology, which is a very small subset of life on any given time. But yeah, the point is it does, it's some huge swath of life. Um, so that's pretty, you know, doesn't matter how, how awesome you were as a dinosaur, you were, you were out and sort of shows some of the randomness that is part of evolution. So people also, another common criticism, well, how can you believe we got this way by randomness? Well, that's not what I think science, scientists who study this are trying to say, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of randomness. And just like we humans, we're pretty well adapted. So are lots of other animals alive today, but they're still going extinct, mm -hmm. right? And um, we're in another, ma we're in the middle of another mass extinction right now. That's what Wikipedia says. It called it Holocene extinction? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that's the name of our current sort of geological bit. They call it, it's an epic, which is one division, small, like periods contain epics. So... But this is the first one that the creature being extinct or, or being pushed into extinction is responsible for the process, right? Uh, I'm not sure. Probably. Yeah. Uh, or, but, you know, we aren't going extinct yet, although we may. I mean, all, all things go extinct in time. But um, we are... Uh, we are driving lots of other things into extinction. I, I don't remember the number, but my my memory one can look it up easily enough on Wikipedia and probably other places. The current rate of extinction is something like ten thousand times faster than normal mm -hmm. right now. Uh, I could be wrong. Maybe it's a thousand. Maybe it's you know, but it's much higher than normal. And we're doing it. I think there's no uh, no way around that. There's maybe some wishful thinking that people might try to say, no, no, it's all these other processes, but. The argument to that is, if it's going to go extinct anyway, there, there, there's going to be new life created. And I'm not saying we should continue to kill the planet, but... I'm with you there. I've had this conversation a number of ways with a number of people. The Earth doesn't care about us. No, I, I would agree with that. We, we're going to die. We're going to go extinct at some point, somehow, and there's going to be a new life form. Mm -hmm. There's going to be something else that takes over and... That's why I don't want to kill the dodo bird, but we did it and it's gone. And now people are upset about it. Everything's going to die. True. Um, well, yes, you could also say that about murder, right? <laughs> we all, nobody gets out of here alive. Yeah. And uh, that doesn't mean we get to cut it short for mm -hmm. other people. True. That'd be another way to look at it. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a believer in absolute morals. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I agree that murder is bad. I agree that driving species to extinction is bad. Mm -hmm. um, in part because biodiversity is important, actually, for the, you know, we don't, we take for granted all of the things that, that this earth ecosystem biosphere does for us, cleans our water, cleans our air, prevents, protects us from ultraviolet radiation from the sun uh, through the ozone layer which you know, ultimately was produced by organisms in the sense that all of the uh, free oxygen in the atmosphere is probably surplus from photosynthesis building up for billions of years. And then uh, radiation converting some of that oxygen into ozone to produce the ozone layer. So ultimately it's a product of the interaction between life and the earth. Well, the earth, life is part of the earth. Like mm -hmm. we are part of the earth. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, it is true, all life will go extinct, but we are interdependent. And the more little, you know, I think of it as like a house of cards, and the more little cards you flip off, mm -hmm. the less stable it becomes. Yeah, for sure. And one thing I can tell you is, so one of the things I show in my classes often is a, is a, cur a, a little curve that shows the last 65 million years of time. And, as, you know, as a geologist, old is on the bottom and young is up. And so, um, and that curve shows basically Earth's 
climatic history over the last 65 million years. And you see there's these wiggles in it every so often. And when you line that curve up on the traditional geological epochs of the last 65 million years, so the Paleocene, Eocene, Oligocene, et cetera, uh, those wiggles are all at the boundaries between those named ages, which were named 150 years before that curve was developed. And the reason is that those names come from identifying marine invertebrates, and they're disappearing between those events. S Just marine? Well, the names for most of the geological periods were largely based off the marine fossil record. Okay. Yes, other animals too, but the marine fossil record's a lot better than the fossil record for things that live on the land. Well, how beneficial is it that we can even study that and figure it out? If our bones were made of something different, we wouldn't have any idea. Indeed. Indeed. And uh, But what I'm trying to get at is whenever the, there's a dramatic shift in climate, it's rarely good for the things that are already here. Yeah. Yeah, well, that requires change. Yes. And so, yes, it is true that things are going to go extinct. And yes, it is true that the earth will be fine. And yes, it is true that uh, all species are going to go extinct eventually. That doesn't mean we need to help them along. And we might actually be a lot happier and healthier ourselves if we don't. I agree. Let me clarify. I'm not saying kill everything. <laughs> no, no. I, but I, I think it's worth thinking about because for me, I look around at what's happening uh, on the earth with some dismay and quite a bit of fear. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the fossil record gives me a little perspective, kind of calms me down a little bit. That is the crazy thing about studying and understanding any of this stuff. It It's the same, I equate it to when you try to understand how much money a billion dollars is. Oof, you yeah. can't fathom it. No. And when you talk about dinosaurs existing for 180 million years, that just... That's just a number. Like, mm -hmm. I have no idea what that means. And so before you came in here, I looked it up. Uh, one million years divided by 80 mm -hmm. is a normal human life. Yeah. That's 12,500 human lives. Yeah. I would have to live 12,500 times for 80 years, back to back to back, for one million years. Yeah. yeah. And one million years is a tiny part yes. of, of time. It's... I will be, I can't fathom it either. I, I can understand it mathematically. I can, I can, like you did, I can scale human life and think about how many human lives that is. I, it's, but it's in the same way as when somebody says, oh yeah, the nearest star is four light years away. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's hard to quantify in our brains, probably because we only live for 80 years. We yeah. don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I want to go back to the little shrew. What, what did we... I looked it up, too. I can't remember now. Well, there's, a, there's a few early of these very uh, post... Um, and in fact, there was a paper that came out about two years ago in science. Really cool. There's a new sequence of uh, sediments, some of the most continuous, one of the best terrestrial fossil records of what happened immediately after that extraterrestrial impact. And they sort of show the recovery time of the, and this, it's, it's located in Colorado. So we're, I don't know how far is Colorado from Yucatan. I don't, I don't know, 5,000 kilometers, something like that. Okay. Maybe it's seven. I don't know. Anyway, it's far. Uh, but you, you, you know, they show how the ecosystem is pretty much just devastated mm -hmm. right after this event. And then you slowly get different components back over time. And I don't remember the exact sequence. This paper lays out, you know, this many hundred thousand years later, we're starting to get plants. And then this many hundred thousand years later, we're getting a little more complicated animals. And, you know, it just they kind of show how it, the ecosystem takes a while. And it comes, it doesn't get back to what it was, but it becomes something different. But it seems to be a more complete, richer uh, ecosystem mm -hmm. than it was after the impact. And it, you know, according to this paper, it was around a million years before it was something similarly complex to what was there before. It took a million years. Yeah. And so I've seen uh, some other papers that talk about, well, the recovery time is sort of proportional to the severity of the event. And so like Mount St. Helens, pretty bad event. Um, I don't know if it's recovered yet or not, but there's a lot of, it's sort of 
recovered a long way in what's been 42 years. Yeah. And um, that's, but on, uh, you know, compared to <laughs> this extraterrestrial impact, that's a pretty tiny event. Mm -hmm. So, but 42 years is pretty tiny next to a million years. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are, my understanding is that big event at the end of the um, Permian, you know, I, I, I don't remember what article I saw this in, so, so you know, internet world, don't quote me here, but uh, that they, they are estimating kind of the recovery after that at five to 10 million years, suggesting that that was a dramatically more severe event. And what amazes me is that we're still here. And I think that to me is the thing that is so interesting about Earth and why we are far and away the most interesting and strangest planet we've ever even seen. Because like Mars, maybe Mars had life. And that would be, to me, you know, discovery of the millennium, life on Mars, or that there was at one time. But the difference is it, it, the environment of Mars got too out of hand and it is no longer there. Mm -hmm. But Earth has remained stable for four billion years, mm -hmm. that's got to be really rare. It's the perfect situation for us yeah. and all these other things to thrive. Yeah. And we keep doing it regardless of events that try to take us all out. Something will eventually, but it, it's, you know, I mean, it, worst case scenario, best case scenario, it's about five billion years away when the sun, you know, becomes a red giant mm -hmm. and swallows. We got some planet. time to figure it out. It's longer than there's been. So yeah, <laughs> you know, it's not gonna bother you or me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so these, these little guys are hanging out for a million plus years mm. and slowly developing and from all the videos I've seen, kind of growing into tiny little monkeys, mm -hmm. essentially, long tails yeah. and spending their time in the trees and not really doing much on the ground. They kind of existed in trees, right? Well, so you mean the ones that lead to us? Yes. Ultimately, yeah. So yes. there's mammals doing all kinds of things. They're going, they're, they're ones on the ground. There's ones that are learning to fly and there's ones that are invading the oceans and so on and so forth. But yeah, you're right. So in terms of the primate story, little shrewy things in the beginning. And what's so interesting is actually North America is one of the best places for these very early primate fossils, the Western US, places like Wyoming. Um, which not really prime primate real estate these days, mm -hmm. and um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a um, and then you're getting uh, I, I want to add to that because uh, one of the one of the things that I think people have in their head about evolution is that it's linear, mm -hmm. that it's kind of like you know um, A to B. Um, but there's a lot of branching that's happening too. There's a lot of increasing diversity that's going on. And so, uh, yeah, things are going extinct too. So maybe the overall net diversity is not changing as much, but any group of organisms is gonna have speciation events that are happening too. And then one species may go kind of one way and another species another. So yes, they are going to be, yes. So we're getting little primates. They're all arboreal in the early days. That's correct. What is arboreal? Oh, sorry. Uh, tree living. Okay. Tree living. Tree living. And I think that's a fair thing. So if you, you know, if we look at mammals, if we could characterize whales as like marine adapted mammals and bats as flight adapted mammals, I think it's fair to say primates are tree adapted mammals. Okay. But after a certain amount of time, things dry up a bit mm -hmm. and they have to come down out of the trees. And that's when we kind of develop the ability to walk, right? And to use our, our hind legs more? Yes. So uh, that's that's a gen, that's that's the mile high view. Yeah. Yes. So um, now, it, yeah, so uh, things are getting drier. Uh, forests are generally shrinking. Um, it's, you know, my, my understanding that uh, the expansion of grasslands is beginning around 25 million years ago, um, but it's, it's baby steps. And we, we at various times, so, so generally speaking, in, when we talk about global climate in the past, warmer means wetter. More evaporation off the ocean means more precipitation. Sorry about that. Hang Sorry. Uh, more evaporation off the ocean leads to more precipitation on the land, which generally means more vegetation. Um, and in fact, around 50 million years ago, 
when the climate was about as warm as it was going to get for the last 65 million years. Warmer even than we'll probably get it to with human activity. Um, it was around 8 degrees Celsius warmer on average than, than today. It's, um, there were forests up on Ellesmere Island, which is above the Arctic Circle. Mm -hmm. And even when you adjust for the plate tectonic movement of North America, it was still like 67 degrees north. Um, so there was a lot more forest around. And so, yeah, generally speaking, over time, the amount of tree cover has been reduced. But there's obviously still places with trees. There are still primates that do nothing but live in trees. Mm -hmm. But we happen to be from a lineage that focus, that, that shifted to, to being uh, adapted to the ground. And there are other primates that did it. So not all of them became walkers like us. In fact, none of them did. But baboons, for example, are a great exam uh, great. Uh, representative of a, another group of primates that spend most of their time on the ground. So how did that benefit us to become walkers? That's a really good, that's like the, the million dollar question in paleoanthropology, which is the study of human evolution. Um, and what I would say is it's good to think of walk, uh, think of it as happening in steps, <laughs> so to speak. Um, the reason that we maybe started walking on our hind legs may not be the same reason that it became advantageous later. So, for example, if you look at a, if you measure how many calories a human uses walking a specific, say, a hundred meters, and then if you measure how many calories a human uses crawling that same distance, we'll use a lot more calories crawling that hundred meters than we will walking it. And if you use uh, if you do that same, th uh, if you look at our closest relatives, some of the great apes, like say a chimpanzee, and you measure how many calories they use moving the way that they would prefer to, which would be on all fours. It's not crawling by any means. It's something they call knuckle walking. Um, they will use a little bit more than, they will use far less than we do crawling, <laughs> but they'll use a little bit more than we do walking. Yeah. Um, if you make them walk, they will use a little bit more calories than they would because they're not really built to walk like we are. They can do it but they, they're, they don't move at, in the same way. Um, and if you send them through the trees over that same distance, they'll actually be pretty efficient too. We won't. If we, we're pretty good clean tr tree climbers because of our primate heritage, but we use a lot more calories climbing trees than we do walking. Yeah. Um, so one argument is that it's, a, it's an energy efficiency adaptation okay. to cover, you know, when you don't have trees to move through, if you're gonna have to move on the ground, Maybe walking is a calorie saving thing. But when we look at one second, I see what I, I know I get going. <laughs> That's uh, all right. So, so, but when we look at the very earliest humans, the fossils that we have that are really close to the when we think we diverged from our closest living relatives, and we have some partial skeletons where we can look at things like limb proportions. And when you do the biomechanics and you calculate the energetics, they were not efficient. Walkers, they were not saving calories by walking. Well, okay, so but all of this to happen, you're saying saving calories in order to not expend more energy mm -hmm. and then grow bigger? Mm. Life is all about, so evolu energy is the currency of life. Okay. And from an evolutionary perspective, and trust me, I am a big advocate in many different perspectives on life. But from an evolutionary perspective, um, calories spent inefficiently are calories that you can't use for other things. So that could be uh, reproductive effort. That could be disease resistance. That could be repair. Just like, you know, when people are nutritionally stressed, when they're starving, they're more prone to get sick, right? Huh. So any energy you spend that you don't have to is energy that you could have spent not dying from disease or maybe having more offspring. Okay. So all of these ancestors of ours who came down on the trees and were walking around and not expending as many calories, they were more resistant to disease. They were better at avoiding predators and therefore became part of Darwin's survival of the fittest because they were the best fit to right. surpass all the things trying to kill them. Sure. They were the ones that, that succeeded and lived. Well, that's okay. So let me unpack that a little bit because yes, 
Um, but there's a lot of there was a lot there <laughs> from from my perspective. Like that'd be that'd be several weeks of lectures right there. So <laughs> so I'll try to do that in less than several weeks though. I know my prof my inner professor is trying to. You're but, like, slow down, man. That's too much. I, I gotta. So all right. Um, first, yes. So generally speaking, the more energy that you're not spending inefficiently, uh, you have for other things, and that could be disease fighting. Uh, could be other things. It, and it depends on whether disease was a big pressure for you or not and all these things. Um, the way we could look at it is like a budget. Like your economic, you, you get your salary. You can spend your money on investing in things. You can spend your money on school for your kids. You can spend your money on, you know, shiny shoes or whatever. And you can weigh the benefits or costs of what are those, right? Maybe you might say, oh, shiny shoes, what a terrible investment. Well, if they help you reproduce, it might not be a bad investment. <laughs> so from an evolutionary perspective, yeah. right? So... Um, but anyway, uh, so there's that. So yes. And, uh, making you fitter. So the, the, the key thing about fitness is it's a probability statement. It is not a success statement. So what I mean by that is <clears throat> in, 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 in a evolutionary theory, fitness is your probability of surviving and reproducing. And that's where the dinosaur example is a great one. They were really fit. But there's no guarantees in this world. Mm -hmm. And so they were, no matter how fit they were, gone. Um, so fitness is also a thing that really only matters relative to other members of your species. It doesn't matter how, like, it's really hard to compare the fitness of, say, a human to something else. To a cheetah. To a cheetah. Because, A, we're not really... If we are directly competing for something like access to carcasses on the landscape, okay, then we can talk about who's a more efficient hunter, who is succeeding, who's getting access to those carcasses first, who's getting to eat them more. But what where fitness is really more relevant is, is cheetah A faster than cheetah B? Yeah, that's like if if there's a killer in your house, you just have to be the fastest person right. running away from them. Right? right, I don't have to outrun you, I just have to outrun the bear. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, or sorry, I don't have to outrun the bear. I have to outrun yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that's exact. And my point there is like whether it, it's sort of a, what matters is like, okay, is, is individual A more fit than individual B? But sometimes the less fit individual still succeeds more just because of chance. Okay. And also brain activity yeah. starts to become a thing. Yes. Someone who is smarter... Yeah, for some reason, is better than someone who's fast. Well, maybe more fit. Yes, and I think and brain evolution is a long story. Like we like to think about our brains a lot because we have fairly large ones, but you know, we can see this with other animals too. Like a crow being a little more clever than a hawk, and maybe actually beating the hawk at its own game sometimes because mm -hmm. of that. So there's not just humans have an advantage to cleverness, but our, our intelligence comes at a cost. It's a big one too. Um, and that is that your nervous system is a tremendous calorie burner. Okay. It, you, your nervous system uses more energy than your muscular system. Well, we've become more reliant on it too. We yeah, don't have yes. to run away from cheetahs. Well, let me please, you ever had a, like when I was a kid, I had a pet snake. Uh -huh. the, a reason for us, snake to be a good pet is you'd only need to feed it like once a month part of that reason it has a metabolism that's basically very minimal it doesn't maintain its own body temperature which is most of which is a lot of what we spend our calories on is just staying keeping our body at the right temperature um but also our brain is burning a tremendous amount of calories i don't remember the precise figures but um a huge swath of our caloric usage of your what they call your basal metabolic rate is just your nervous system and a large part of it's your brain um and uh so the point i'm trying to make with that is that that energy as we were talking about before could be used for other things so if you don't need to be that smart you might be more fit being less intelligent mm -hmm. now so, we don't like that's not the narrative we often like but that, you know. So are snakes not very smart? Uh, I mean, they, I don't want to say they're dumb. They're like, it's all relative. 
<laughs> like so, but I mean, they they have a lot. You know, they may have intellectual abilities that they are better at than we are. Yeah. Well, and, they're doing something right if they're yeah, still around. Yeah, that's kind of what I mean. Like yeah. it, it, they are they're as smart as they need to be. Yeah. And um, the quite you know thing I wonder like think about it this way. It's not only that your brain is expensive energetically, it's expensive to grow and it takes a long time to grow. That's part of probably why we take so much longer to get, you know, if you ever had a dog, right? They're, they're adult within a year. Mm-hmm. People take a bit longer than that. And um, a lot of that is probably neural development. Neuro, the fact that your brain, you know, takes a long time to grow that nervous system. So it slows you down. And from an evolutionary perspective, every year spent growing is a year not out there trying to survive and reproduce. Well, yeah, we're also the, we take the most time to develop in terms of uh, being unprotected. Like you, mm-hmm. you can't have, you can't just have a baby that's one year old and like put it in the forest. No, that no. doesn't work well. No, we have to take care of our offspring for far longer than any other <laughs> member of the animal kingdom. Sometimes for 30 odd years, yes, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or, right, but that's absolutely true. We, I mean, I, I don't know if, if there isn't some, other thing that takes longer, but we, yeah, we take a huge amount of time and it's a huge amount of investment. We have relatively few offspring, right? By any measure. Yeah. Even, even somebody with 15 kids, whatever, which that's not very many compared to like a snake. Yeah. And, um, so we are, we are putting our, you know, but to survive as a human, to be a successful human takes lots of investment from the parents. So that's another cost of all that braininess, right? Is all that parental investment. And, you know, every year that you're growing, there's a chance you could die. And if you think about it, like you, everybody throws around these statistics. Oh, you know, in colonial times, you know, I think infant mortality was hovering around 50%. You know, um, so a lot of people died before they ever got to, to the age where they could be successfully a parent. That's why uh, the the median age for right. for uh, for a human life was so skewed for so long because just to make it to ten years old right. w- was like an act of God. <laughs> like you yeah. could have six or eight children, and only one of them would make it past ten. Absolutely, yeah. That's and that's even somebody you know Lincoln. I think about half his kids, a no, large you know number of his children uh, died, and. Um, yeah, infant mortality is is right. So when people are throwing, oh yes, you know, seventy two hundred years ago, the average person only lived to be thirty five. Well, yes, at birth, the average mm-hmm. age was thirty five. But if you made it to five, you're, then the average age was probably closer to forty five or fifty. Yeah, and then, and there were plenty of old people around, but it was a smaller, you know, the pyramid was more you know, funnel shaped. Yeah, there are probably far less younger kids. There were a lot of kids around. But I mean, of, not past 10. Oh, well, yeah, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Yeah. There, there were old people, but not many That's children, a good question. I, right? I, don't, I don't know. I don't know the demography well enough to say. Yeah, I mean, that must have been brutal. I, for, I mean, up until probably 100 years ago. I yeah. mean, with the with um, smallpox eradication mm-hmm. and polio, because smallpox used to kill a ton of people. Yeah, that's true. I, I don't know the numbers, but I know that, yes, more, you know, vaccines have done a lot. Vaccines are good. <laughs> Back to being in the trees and getting yeah. down and walking around. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but what I've read and heard is that our mouths were bigger, our jaws were bigger mm-hmm. because we had to chew and ingest raw meat and so that took far more jaw power and our brains were smaller and then with the not invention but the discovery of fire and we figured out we could cook our meat Mm. then it was not as difficult to chew and ingest and then our mouths got smaller and our brains got bigger is that correct well it's not wrong um i i would put it a little differently and i think there's a few steps in there too okay so early in human evolution, so first off, so we generally mark evol- you know, human evolution proper as beginning. And this is just convention. You could start it with the formation of the planet if you wanted to. But the, as you, you very astutely pointed out, 
all life is connected and has, you know, to be here, we must have had an ancestor that made it for the last several billion years. But we conventionally mark the, the sort of purview of paleoanthropology as when humans sort of speciated from our closest living relatives and we became a, a distinct lineage. But within that lineage, there were many species that speciated and went extinct and speciated and went extinct. Um, and uh, the early ones did have much larger teeth relative to their body size and jaws than we do now, but it was probably for processing plants. Hmm. The earliest human relatives were probably largely vegetarians. Uh, maybe they were like chimpanzees today, which eat a little bit of meat, but mostly eat plant foods. Um, and uh, I fully agree that meat, raw meat is tougher than cooked meat, or at least it can be. <laughs> if you cook meat wrong, it can be tougher too. Um, so that's fully true. Is that why our jaws got smaller? Maybe, uh, or part of it, I would say. Fire is certainly a part of the story. But we actually see evidence for jaw reduction and tooth, uh, sorry, smaller jaws and smaller teeth before we have any firm evidence for control of fire. Hmm. What we do have evidence for is the starting to use stone tools. And I think it's a similar idea though. If you can do some of the processing with a stone tool instead of your, your teeth, um, that will save you some jaw size and jaw musculature. So you're saying that people started cutting up their food into smaller pieces? Or maybe um, uh, possibly, or they were using it to to process it some other way, maybe grind it or, or, or whatever, um, or gain access to food. Like, so imagine a, okay, I don't think they were eating coconuts, but think about a coconut. You could crack that open with stone and then have access to the softer parts. Mm -hmm. Or in some other way, preparing the food so that your teeth don't have to do all the work. Okay. And I don't know when, you know, when we look at living apes today, a lot of them are tool users. A lot of them use sticks or modify sticks to do things, you know, the famous, you know, termite fishing. Um, there's even some populations of chimpanzees that'll spear little, little primates called galagos. Um, they, you know, will use leaves to, to collect water out of trees and things, you know, that get, that get trapped in little hollows in the trees. So they're, they're avid tool users. In fact, there's a, there's some actually primate archeology span out there too. Um, some other species of primates will crack open, uh, like, uh, mussels and things like that. Do we have any primates that understand how to start fire? Not that I know of. No? Not outside of humans. Um, but, uh. That would be an experiment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, to my knowledge, that would be the kind of thing that would probably be pretty easy to spot. And I don't think it's ever been seen. But, but they, I mean, what if you just gave fire starting utensils to a primate? <laughs> There are a lot of eth like <laughs> ethical considerations there. Um, I don't know what would happen. Mm. That's a good, you know, it's a fun thought experiment. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry. I'm not uh, trying. I actually think it, could it be interesting? Yes. Uh, could it also do a lot of harm to those animals? Probably. Mm -hmm. Well, it just makes me think where, where are they at? the most intelligent primates that we study today, where are they at in terms of where we are if you put them at three million years ago? Well, here's what I was going to say. If you, if, you, if you assert a linear scale of intelligence, which I'm going to push back against. So what the way I would look at it is we have lots of different cognitive abilities. I don't act... Okay. I'm going to tell you an assumption that I hold as true, but it is an assumption but I think it fits what I see in the world. Intelligence isn't a thing. It's many things. It's a multidimensional. It's sort of like saying, oh, person A is stronger than person B. Well, okay, but that may be true in some cases that they're stronger in every way, but maybe person A can deadlift a lot of weight, but person B can run for a really long time, or, right? You know, or maybe somebody has stronger legs and somebody has stronger arms. Well, in the same way, I think the mind has different abilities. So memory, spatial understanding, social intelligence, what they call theory of mind, like I can kind of look at you and guess what you're kind of thinking. You know, I can't, by the way, I'm not good at that. <laughs> but, um, but just, I think... There are so many different abilities that we shove together as intelligence. 
And here's where, I, here's where I'm going to go. And we all have different abilities in different dimensions. And yes, we might have a lot more ability than, say, a chimpanzee in many of those dimensions. But they may have some areas where they're actually a little sharper than we are. And so to put it on a linear scale, but what I would say is if we just look at raw brain size, which is a terrible way to measure intelligence, by the way, and has been used in the past for some very false, horrible, racist, racist yeah. science. Yeah. Yeah. But in a broad sense, you know, look, a lizard has a really small brain. A monkey has a bigger brain. A monkey is generally pretty cognitively more capable than a lizard. And... Uh, you know, uh, generally speaking, the apes most like us, the great apes, not because they're awesome, because they're big, great meaning large. So chimpanzees, gorillas, orangs, uh, bonobos, they are really sharp is how I would put it. And um, well, if we sort of just use the brain size angle, which is, as I just said, a terrible way to do it, but it's the only way I can think of right now. Mm -hmm is um, I would say, you know, from about 6 million years ago when we first diverged from our closest living relatives to maybe 2.5 million years ago, my guess is there's not a lot of cognitive ability difference between those early humans and modern apes. Hmm. There may be certain w things about them. That, I don't mean to say that their minds were identical, but just raw processing power um, well, what I was thinking when I thought about this before you got here and I wanted to ask you is if that were the case, wouldn't we just stop eating food and drinking or even like putting vitamins and nutrients through IVs and then our mouth would disappear and then our brain would just be massive and then we'd be smartest ever. Yes, but is that really so? Okay. <laughs> I love that thought because we're thinking about the future and nobody can say you're wrong, Right. Um, but what I would say is I, in one of my favorite movies, it's really depressing little kids movie called Wally. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen that, uh -huh. which I was like, wow, that's kind of heavy for a little kid. But yeah. yeah, uh, at least I thought it was, <laughs> maybe I'm overreading it, but, uh, I think about the spaceship where everybody's just sits in their chairs and yeah. they float around and they have their giant, enormous, you know, soda. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I think that's very similar to the vision you just presented. Uh, I think the truth is in, in the wild world, there's not a lot of opportunity to drink your nutrition. But sure, you could probably come pretty close to that. You know, this is going to sound weird, but drinking blood would be the closest I would guess because it's probably got most of the nutrients you need. Hmm. I, I don't know if that would work. Don't do it. Um, <laughs> I just I just was thinking like if you, but but is it possible that we could come up with a way of just but everything has consequences. Like this is a real, this is one of the reasons I really like teaching about evolution because the body is not a machine. I know people like to use that analogy, especially in medicine, but it's not. Machines are assembled from parts. Bodies grow. Furthermore, we have an evolutionary history, which means we are not optimally designed by an engineer. We are an, accu uh, an accumulation of past things that happened to work at that time. Transmitted through an, a system of inheritance, which we are still trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. But we're also creatures with emotion yes. who gain satisfaction from the nuance. Yes. You eat a piece of lobster that's been dipped in butter <laughs> and your head explodes. I mean, yeah. who wants to who wants to give that up to get an IV of nutrients? You, I, I I wouldn't. No, it, it's it's a different experience <laughs> being a human, and I'm sure it's the same if you're an animal too. Yeah. Just you maybe don't understand it or appreciate it quite the same way, but or or maybe you do, and we just you just can't tell us humans about it. Yeah. Um. What I would say is, there's a, you know I can't. Why does that taste so good to us? Well, if you think about what would have been available to foragers in our past, fat is not high on the list, but it's necessary. Despite it gets a bad name these days, in my opinion. And so, why do we create? Why does that taste so good? Because we have been evolutionarily tuned to think that is the best flavor in the world, especially when you add salt to it. Mm -hmm. 
because salt would have also been a rare thing that we need. We, we shouldn't have as much as we get now, but that's because we're able to shape our environment now. So evolution shaped us to crave fat and salt because those were the hardest things for us to get on our menu in, in, in the past. But since we've been able to shape our world more and more, we're like, we need a world with more fat and salt in it. And so we've made these things so available, it actually has a cost. Yeah, and we became gluttons to our environment. Well, what I would say is evolution probably shaped what we crave to, f to make us survive in the past, but things have changed more rapidly than our physiology has been able to evolve. And also what I was going to say is your body needs, your growing, developing body is, is tuned to a world, you know, has expectations like you're going to have a gut flora. Uh, you're going to have parasites. You're going to have um, all kinds of other interactions with the world around you that are that actually train uh, those things. And so if we were to go to no feeding, that might work from a nutritional standpoint, but there may be other consequences that we don't foresee that might make that a really bad decision. Yeah. Like I think of COVID. Yes, we stayed out of, we stayed home for a couple of years. But that has had consequences for lots of people. Significant mental health consequences. Yeah. 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 And not that it, I'm not here to say what, whether it was or was not worth it. That's mm -hmm. not my, I certainly wouldn't want to opine on that or, or uh, put it out there. But my point there is just un the law of unintended consequences suggests to me that going all IV is a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a fan. Let's not do it. <laughs> um, but I think that's a really interesting way to look at, because um, there's, a, there's a whole field, and I am not an expert in this field, but I think it's fascinating, called evolutionary medicine, which is about thinking about, it's about getting away from the model of the body as machine. Machines are assembled from parts. Bodies are not assembled from parts, other than in Blade Runner, right? They are... <laughs> They are um, grown, and they're grown based on uh, developmental physiological properties that have evolved over four billion years. And so, and evolution has to make lots of compromises. When you talk about energy budgets, right, you have to make a compromise between reproductive effort and not dying. Same idea with growth, has to make compromises between different things. So yes, would it be awesome if we could have the world's best brain and reproduce rapidly? I mean, maybe not from the Earth's perspective, but from your fitness perspective, yes. But that's not, life is full of trade-offs. And so often some of the things that we think of as like, why are we getting sick? Are maybe more because of evolutionary trade-offs. Yeah, well, and our environment is full of bacteria yes. that also want to survive. Yes. And their goal is to kill us. Not always. Well, well maybe not necessarily to kill us, but to spread and reproduce. And, and the way they do that is getting in our bodies. But most bacteria are really helpful. That's sure. the thing to bear in mind. Yeah. Like, and it's often, sometimes things that are helpful in some contexts can be harmful in others. Mm -hmm. It's when they get out of balance or when things, something, and so this is one of the unintended consequences of like antibiotic use. Mm-hmm. It really messes with all of the microorganisms on and in our bodies, you know, that uh, that can throw them out of balance and yeah. that can cause all kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you didn't use the word symbiosis, but that's what it makes me think of it is. Wh where you're talking prior. Like everything is is reliant on everything else mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the food chain and everything. There are ants that yeah. eat decomposing bodies of whatever and then other things that eat the ants and so forth and mm -hmm. yeah you start taking some of those items out and it can just upset the balance of everything indeed and as it can in a, and if you think of yourself as like a little micro as a mini ecosystem uh things that we do throw that you know and eating processed foods um so I, i'm gonna go on a really crazy tangent do here. It. i'm sorry but do it here we go this is one of the things like people talk about, oh, we got to go colonize Mars or some people do. I, I don't, but some people do. I'm all for going there, having a visit, whatever. But colonizing, I just think about like, we're already seeing just by living in our urbanized society, the degradation of our microbiomes compared to 
uh, what they probably were in, in other times. And when we look at modern people who live in a foraging context, they're much richer microbiomes, much healthier microbiomes. Think about what that's going to be like on some Mars colony. That's going to be so out of whack, and there's going to be no way to get it back into, into a line. That and also the thing that I think about more these days is your mental oh, bio. I'm not even going there, but yeah, that would be a real challenge. Yeah. Because your body is this crazy place of checks and balances that you are ultimately in charge of. And there's a number of ways you can benefit yourself and a number of ways you can screw it up. And I think the, I mean, there's definitely diet issues these days, but I think an even bigger issue is, is the, the mental junk food mm -hmm. that people are just like gorging themselves on all the time. Mm -hmm. You, it's hard to say no to addictive stuff and you don't even know that you're really doing it mm -hmm. and it can dramatically mess you up, which then makes you eat crappy food. And it's just like this huge thing that can just wreck everything. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, going to Mars <laughs> is not going to fix it. No, no. I was just thinking, you know. No, I'm not people, saying that's what you people said. People approach it as an engineering challenge, and I think it's also there's a bigger biological challenge besides the technical challenge of getting there and establish. You know, and there's so many. I don't want to talk about Mars colonization so much, but I was just thinking like this is another challenge. And your point about the mental health issues and gore, you know, like. What I think about, and this has nothing to do with my professional training, but what I think about the, you know, the, the brightest minds in psychology are not going into clinical practice. They're figuring out how to get you to pay attention to their app for five more seconds. <laughs> and they're probably, they're certainly smarter than I am, mm -hmm. you know, so they're probably going to win. Yeah. I was thinking the other day, I used to really admire Steve Jobs and everything that he accomplished. And the more I think about everything that's happened with the iPhone, I'm like, that might be the downfall of mm -hmm. our civilization. Mm. It was really cool for a few years. And now, I mean, I use it for three or four apps. Yeah, yeah. It's I, this massive supercomputer that's capable of doing so much harm. Mm. And we're all carrying one around. It's That's a good, well. interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to go dark and all that, but yeah, I, <laughs> I think you're you're right. I bet, like, I don't know. Uh, yes, <laughs> we, we, we can go to something else. No, it's fair. I just I don't know what else to say other than yeah. I kind of agree. Yeah. Well, okay. So I kind of wanted to like try to hit milestones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so, because you are a, an expert on evolution and, and primate uh, development. Yeah, or evolution yeah. and evolution. And, and, okay, so. Uh, th this event happened in uh, 65 million years ago. Yeah. We, a bunch of time goes by. We discover fire. The next really super important thing is, um, why am I drawing a blank? Uh, cultivation of land. Okay. Right? I don't know. I mean, I personally am not sure. Like, uh, So certainly uh, bipedalism is a big thing. So huh. walking around on two legs as opposed to four because that frees your hands up. And then you develop tools. And you can use them as ways to explore your environment, develop tools, carry things like kids. Um, so one of the things that's interesting is humans, uh, other like other primates, um, most of them, their infants from the day they're born can hold on to mom or whatever parent. Um, they're more precocious than our babies are. Our, you know, if you ever seen a human baby, they can't do a lot when they're first born. They can't hold on to anything really. Um, so we have a little, we have a little more dependent offspring. And so because they can't hold on, we have to hold on to them. And I saw, you know, I've seen, there's some really interesting research that looks at the energetics of carrying a kid around. It's huge. I mean, if you ever, you're, you're a parent, you've probably carried your kids around. You know, sure. They're really heavy. And if you imagine, you know, I'm sure that took a lot of, so that's a cost, right? So whatever, um, evolutionary factor was favoring having more dependent children must have been had some pretty big benefits too well there's also a lot of love involved that well, but, you're, you're transmuting to them while you're carrying them mm -hmm. but what i would say is yes there is and as a you know when we talk about emotions there's many ways to think about them one is the experience of them which is a really important thing 
and I, I remember after the birth of my daughter, um, you know, you're kind of flooded with oxytocin. And I was just like, man, they should sell this stuff. This is, the, <laughs> you know, anyway. Um, but anyhow, uh, that's a real powerful feeling. But, you know, Darwin even, if you read uh, his, his work, um, talks about, well, but why? And there are many whys you could give. And I, I do not want to prioritize one over another. But there is an evolutionary perspective on that. Like, well... Evolution probably is, if you can think of emotions from an evolutionary perspective, it's a way of packaging complex decisions that without you having to use a lot of mental processing power, make you do what is the advantageous behavior most of the time, or at least on average. And so we might think of that as humans, one of the things that humans do seem to do is have a strong tendency to form very durable bonds, social bonds. We're a very social species. Mm -hmm. you know, some are more, some are less. Cat, maybe a little less. Dog, maybe similar. Um, and uh, I think that if you think about the past, foragers in the past who loved their children and carried them as opposed to be like, you know what, this kid's getting heavy. <laughs> Just leave them there. Figure it out. <laughs> Figure it out, kid. Um, probably had more of their offspring survive. Right? And, um, you know, sometimes emotions can be fear. Well, sometimes that's a good way of like, your, you know, your, psych your, your subconscious kind of saying, you've been in situations like this before. They have never ended well. Don't keep walking down that dark corridor or whatever. Um without have you having to sit there and process it, right? It's just mm -hmm. your, your, I don't know. I, that's out of my depth as, you know, I'm, I'm more reporting what I have read there than, than really what I have firsthand experience with. But, um, you know, Darwin did do the thought experiment of like, what would, what evolutionary pressures would shape our emotions and why would they be the way they are? And one way to think about it is like, I am sure dogs and cats and other mammals have rich emotional lives. Is there scientific evidence for this? I don't know. That's not an area that I'm an expert in. But one of the things that I have seen in my years in studying human evolution is that everything we used to think was totally unique about humans probably isn't. And it occurs in some form in our closest living relatives. Because what are the odds of all these things evolving, as we just talked about, six million years is nothing from an evolutionary time frame. What are the odds that all this stuff just appears brand new in us? More likely, it's shared with our close relatives. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense that we would end up where we are in the amount of time that we did. If you go back and look at the dinosaurs, like I was saying, 180 million years, and they were just reptiles forever, just mm -hmm. eating each other. Why did they not develop iPhones and skyscrapers and airplanes? What were they doing? Well, I don't know. Um, that's a, that's a why didn't something happen is always harder to answer than why did something happen. What we can say is that dinosaurs were not nearly as cognitively complex as modern humans or modern birds for that matter, which are their descendants, right? Um, you know, I don't know exactly, but I've seen the skull. I just happened to be in the museum in Berlin doing my own research. Uh, several a few years ago, back in 2016, but they have a the a skull of um, one of these. Uh, I think it's a patasaurus, one of these big sauropods, you know, these huge ten elephant mass dinosaurs. And it's only about this big. And you think, okay, you can still fit a pretty big brain in that. But then when you look at how much of it is actually brain case, it's you know less than this cup, mm -hmm. and that's controlling this enormous body. And so they just, now some dinosaurs were probably a lot more uh, encephalized, meaning bigger brained than, than those big sauropods, maybe some of the fast predators or something like that. Um, but uh, they, so that would be a large part of it. And there may be animals that are just as cognitively as complex as we are. They just don't have the ability to manipulate their environment the way we do. I think of like, dolphins or something like that yeah 
They just can't communicate it to us. And they, right. And I'm not saying they are or aren't. I, I'm sort of agnostic on that. Mm -hmm. They are what they are and, you know, more power to them. Mm -hmm. But uh, I could, you know, and my guess is that the animals that we know probably have fairly emotional, they may not be the same emotional reactions that we would have because evolution has shaped them differently to yeah. a particular situation. Yeah. I mean, like you said, we're social beings and it has benefited us to interact that way. And it's, I, I mean, I always think of once you get to, to like the tribal stage and you have 150 people in a tribe, you are reliant on those 149 mm -hmm. people. If for some reason they ostracize you, you're going to die. So you have to be social. You mm -hmm. have to hang out with this person and that mm -hmm. person and clean somebody's rug or, you know, whatever. Like you got to be part of the group. You can't be some wild card doing crazy stuff despite what you see in movies yeah people that that go out on their own don't usually live that long no they may i'm not trying to say it couldn't happen but um you're right and i think one of the interesting things so like human evolution i think uh there's so many things that are fun to look at i think ones that get a lot of attention are brain size the teeth one i'm glad you brought that up because i think that's that's a big deal um, walking on two legs, using tools. People like to talk about this, but there's a lot of other really interesting things that make us different, um, or at least, you know, differentiate us from other primates. Uh, and um, sociality, I think, is is something we share with other primates. Actually, most primates are pretty social. They tend to live in groups. Not all, but they often do. And some of those groups can be big and complex and full of all kinds of complex relationships. And you know, ants are really social too, but ants accomplish their sociality through, I think, pretty hardwired pathways, or at least fairly chemically and fairly kind of reactively. Humans accomplish their sociality in a, in a cognitive way. Mm -hmm. We're really interested in who did what to whom when, and who's sleeping with whom, mm -hmm. and who is, you know, was somebody like good to me the last time I really needed them to be, or mm -hmm. were they kind of not fair... Uh, you know, there's a lot of like, or yeah, I really don't like that guy, but I know that guy's family and I want to be nice to that guy because I don't want to get in trouble with that guy's family. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of, there's a lot, if you think about how we are so good at that, we don't even notice how hard that is to keep track of. Um, it's sort of like facial recognition. Mm -hmm. It's actually something that's very hard to do, but we are very good at it. Well, and women are better than men. Are they? Yes. Okay. At, at, at understanding facial emotion. Oh, okay. I just meant recognizing like, hey, you're, you're Cody yeah. or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, and you can lose that ability. If people, there are people who are sometimes born that, that don't have that ability. And there are uh, people who sometimes have a traumatic event or a tumor or something and they lose the ability. And, and it's like, there are some people that can't recognize their spouse if they just see their face. Yeah. And which just shows you that it's a cognitive process that your mind is spending energy to do. It happens behind the scenes. You don't notice it. It's just like sight. There's a lot of complex trigonometry that's helping you figure out depth, but your brain just does it without you even having to think about it. Yeah, everything comes in upside down, right? And, and all kinds of- Your flips it. Your brain puts together a lot of what you see. It's, it's, it really is all in your mind. Yeah. And, uh, or a lot of it is. And- same thing with recognizing faces, same thing with understanding social relationships, and same thing with working out like, I think I know, like, you know, that old joke, like, I know that you know that I know that you know, <laughs> kind of, yeah. you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think I think that is something, now, now I'm going to move away from science to just a, a thought. I personally think this is why people like soap operas and really dramatic stuff. Kardashians. Yeah, whatever. Anything yeah. like that that's really like who did what to whom and when and why and is, is this, you know, is because it exercises that part of our brain that's really good at that, that we often don't get to run through the paces like we'd like to. And it's very satisfying to use that ability. I think this is just, this is just me throwing out an idea. There's no science to back that up. There's some reason we enjoy drama. Yeah. It's, it's addictive. And I think part of it is that it uses that muscle, so to speak, that we have evolved and it feels good. Well, I wonder if it helped you avoid it somehow. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sure it was vital for, as you pointed out earlier, vital for your survival. 
And to some degree, I almost wonder if it's, be, you know, some of us are so good at it that we, and I'm not including myself in this, but some people are so good at it, they will even put intent on things that are random. You know, I personally think that this could be part of how people started to think about like magic or other things in the sense of, oh man, that tree limb fell on you because X. Mm. Like that, that putting intent into things that have no intent because our brains are just wired that way. Finding meaning in coincidence? Yeah, that's yeah. how I'm putting it, yeah. Because yeah. our brain is also always searching for patterns because that helps us survive. Yeah. But sometimes we may find patterns that aren't really there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's for a very long time, forever, it's been a struggle to not die. <laughs> Still is. Yeah. <laughs> it's just different. Now. It's gotten easier. Some ways. And I, I mean, empirically, yeah. people are living longer and yeah. dying less. Uh, I, I should, right. I should not project onto other people's. Ex it may be harder in a emotional way. I don't know. I can't say. I can't have anyone else's experience. But. But you're right. But I'm just trying to say people still die and it's still hard to avoid. That's the thing. We we have made it so easy. We have to create struggle and drama mm. in different arenas that people never had to consider before. I mean, the last, I would say since probably the 40s, maybe 50s, since the 1950s, it has been dramatically different from all the rest of human existence. Why do you think, why did you choose 1950s? TV. Okay. Think TV. I think the spread of information. Before then, I mean, you could still get manipulated and there's propaganda just like there is mm. now, but it was, it was the radio. It was the newspaper. Mm. I talked to, I talked to, I can't remember who it was now. I talked to somebody about this. I think it really has to do with the industrial revolution. Mm. Like something in that time period, you know, 1850, 60, 70, it really shifted. I don't know. Yeah. This now we're well out of my <laughs> real house here. Um, but as a human, I can think about this and just say, um, I, I agree with you that things are changing and, and I'm sure like, you know, the industrial revolution I would imagine was, was really a long process. It seemed like we, we, we like to put a, it happened here, mm -hmm. but I'm guessing the big thing here is harnessing other sources of energy that allow us to accomplish more work. And I mean that in the physics sense mm -hmm. um, than we could before. And, you know, over time we're getting accumulation of surplus uh, agri you know, food being produced. I shouldn't say surplus because there's still lots of people that don't have enough, but um, we're fewer and fewer people are producing more and more food you know not as many people are engaged with just getting calories yeah. as they would have been and yeah so you've got all this extra new energy sources you have more available resources in terms of food so this, this bringing this back to human evolution makes me think about another point that i like to think about which is that uh, it's important to understand that evolutionary success is not the same thing that we mean by life success. You know, uh, it just means more surviving offspring. <laughs> um, it doesn't mean happy, fulfilled life. Uh, so, so, do you think we're caught up on the wrong thing? Then should we stop trying to be happy? Like our uh, no, our, I, I'm our goal is just to procreate, right? Well, I should see. This is the point I'm trying to make. Just because that is what natural selection shapes you to do, I would not argue that that is what you should do. Because natural selection doesn't care about you either. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, what I mean by that is evolutionary success is just that. But that doesn't mean you're happy. And personally, I like happiness. I think, you know, if I think about my child, I want, you know, of the, do I want her to be evolutionarily successful or do I want her to be happy? I want her to be happy. Mm -hmm. Like to me, that'll make me happy. I can die happy 
if the people in my life that I love are happy. Um, at least most of the time. Mm-hmm. That has nothing to do with whether they're evolutionarily <laughs> successful or not. And that's the thing that I, I think is really important to remember. Like, so when I say evolutionary success, that's really in this very limited realm of survival and reproduction. But to me, like, and, and we have some pretty good evidence that, well, I'll, I'll get back to that point. Um, so it's worth distinguishing that. And there's all kinds of other ways to look at what a fulfilling life is or what a life well lived would be. And I think that's something everybody's got to figure out for themselves. Yeah. Evolution cannot tell us what that should be. Um, or even what our society should be. I think it shapes what we're like, but I don't think it should be like, it, it's telling us what is, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what ought to be. That's another decision. That's other kinds of, you know, to me, that's my opinion. Well, it's shaped by whatever society kind of tells you to. I mean, you can choose to follow your own path and do your own thing, but happiness is is fleeting. You're constantly chasing it, and you you need the the, the bad stuff to compare it to. Mm. And Look, you're yeah. right. The, the, there's this thing that that my mom said to me recently that was, "You're only as happy as your." You're only as happy as your most unhappy child. Hmm. I can't remember exactly how she phrased I it. Think but, I, I think I did But get basically, like, if one of your kids is having a shitty time, then your life is going to be dramatically affected by it as mm-hmm. well. Yeah. You're only as happy as your least happy child, something like that. Okay. So you, you could have a senator. Like, you could be uh, who, uh, JFK's father, whoever it was. I can't remember now. He's got 19 kids. Right. One of them became president. One of them's a senator. But they're all getting whacked, you know? <laughs> Like how awful is that? Joseph Kennedy, I think was his was name. Was it Joseph yeah. Kennedy? Okay. Yeah, a good good point. And um right. Uh and so bringing it back to kind of the human evolution angle, there's some evidence when you you talked about a big event would be, you know, shifting from foraging to maybe uh agriculture. And this is again sort of out of the area that I'm I'm most focused on, but I, I have, you know, read some papers that that really suggest that, um, yeah, people do, trans- there, many societies transition from a more foraging strategy to a more growing food strategy. Uh, and it didn't, it wasn't instant. It would have happened over many, many generations, long time. But many societies undergo the so-called agricultural revolution, but certainly not all. Um, but when people compared the health of people in the same like places, at least a couple of studies, uh, when they look at the foraging people, they look healthier than the people that are the agriculturalists. And you think, wait, more food should be healthier. But part of the problem is uh, you're relying on, on a reduced range of food sources. So you're getting more calories, but you're not necessarily getting the same quality. And so there's some evidence that, that agriculturalists were evolutionarily more successful because they had more energy, because they had more calories, so they had more kids. So in an evolutionary sense, they were more successful, they had more offspring. But from a life fulfillment perspective, they may well have been less happy. Yeah, I mean, at the offset, it sounds like if you're out tending to the fields, you're going to the same spot every day, you're seeing the same stuff. If you're a forager, you might see a cool butterfly or come across a raccoon or like you're you're investigating and you're checking mm-hmm. stuff out and you're adventuring. Sounds more fun. Yeah. But that said, I saw a study recently and this is not a professional thing. I just one of these things that you see in the paper or whatever. Paper is showing how old I am. Um Farmers are among the happiest people in America. Huh. So it's according to this survey. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I don't know if that's true or not. not I don't either. <laughs> but I have no idea. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not trying to put anything on. But that's just what this recent uh, thing that I saw was. It it ranges. D- different people have different levels of. Um, not success, but uh, satisfaction. Mm-hmm. Some people, like my grandma is a great example. She lived on the same street. She's 82 years old. She's lived on the same street in six different houses 
all of her life except for the first couple years. Wow. She loves it. She's yeah. been on one vacation ever. <laughs> she doesn't want to go anywhere. She's totally chill. She's happy. I have to go somewhere every single summer where I feel like I'm missing out on everything. So we're like completely different people. Yeah. yeah. And maybe I get satisfaction. Maybe she has more yeah. than me. It's so crazy how we can be so different yeah. in trying to achieve a life experience. But it, there's no way to measure it between two different people. I'm with you. Look, everybody's a snowflake. I, I, you know, we're all we're all different. Um, just to get back to my point, I want to make sure that I clarify that I'm not trying to say every farmer is very happy. I'm just saying, you know, compared to other Americans and ranked by occupation in well, yeah. this one study, better so, than sitting in a cubicle in an office. Yeah, I mean, maybe I, maybe depends on what's going on in the cubicle, I guess. Um, but I think. Uh, yeah, and I also agree that everybody has different, you know, what may what I may find complete satisfaction and somebody else may not. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, room there for, and and that I, and that's kind of what I was trying to get at with what somebody finds as how they should live a fulfilling life. I personally feel if you looked at evolutionary success as a goal, that would probably most people would probably not find that super fulfilling. I find it very fulfilling to study uh, these things, but that's, but that's what, different. That's what has shifted in the last who knows how many years, 100 years, 150 years, is I wonder what the level of satisfaction or happiness was prior to that. That's a great question. It's hard. How would you know? You would never know. If you were some poor uh, begging child in the streets of Rome, you know, when... when Julius Caesar was in charge and you, you barely could eat a bug or whatever. You didn't know how to read. You, you probably had awesome friends that you hung out with. Maybe. Maybe you didn't know anything about anything. But each day you didn't have anything to accomplish? Hard to say. I, I You know, uh, my guess is that, <laughs> I don't know. My guess is the life of a street urchin in Rome was pretty tough. <laughs> And, uh, you know, maybe not all street urchins are as satisfied as Huck Finn, you know. <laughs> I think that was a literary device as much yeah. as anything. But um, anyway, <laughs> uh, I, I don't, I don't, I, it's a good question. How do you measure, like, I think, again, way out of anything I know, but it's just an interesting idea of trying to measure Rather than worrying about gross domestic product, worrying about happiness, like how can we make, how, how can we maximize people's satisfaction in life? Well, I think that's the problem is that we reached a point where we changed our priorities and I don't know that there's a way back. Don't know. Um, well, you can never go back. I, I am a firm believer in that. And I don't mean that in a progress sense. I just mean, because I'm not a big believer in progress, but what I mean is um, you can never, the past is the past. It, the, 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 the combination of things can never be the same again. Uh, we may like to look back on certain aspects of the past, but they occurred in a context and that context no longer exists. And we may dislike other aspects of the past. Mm -hmm. And... Um, but in a way, it's moot because, you know, as far as I know, time only goes in one direction. Mm -hmm. And just because you recreate one thing you liked about the past doesn't mean everything else will be the same. Yeah. It, it often, my guess is it wouldn't be. Yeah, it's a combination of many factors, but a lot of it is like pop culture. Like I think about Elvis or the mm -hmm. Beatles. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't happen now. It, it happened mm -hmm. specifically at that time because of the way information traveled mm -hmm. and the the nature of the political climate in the world and there's just so many factors that go into making anything happen at any mm. given time mm. and so i agree with you it you can't go back you can't recreate anything it, it's all happening right now in real time and you can appreciate it or hate it right it seems to me like the the I, I, I don't know much about media, but it seems pretty fragmented these days. Uh -huh. There's there's something for everybody. 
and or thousand things for everybody. Yeah. And uh, it seems like it would be really hard to be that dominant on in in a society. Yeah, at least in the U.S. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it's it feels like it's um, that there's enough little little avenues for everybody to investigate that there's no reason that everybody needs to listen to. And I think we also, there's, there's a bit of a narrative there too, right? Because Elvis was popular, but I don't know if like, not everybody listened to Elvis. Mm -hmm. A lot of people listen to other things. Some people probably just liked Beethoven. Yeah. I, I was showing my kids the video of him shaking his hips on TV and that was too much. For all these, uh, not for my kids. Oh, for, I was like, oh, really? You no, know, my kids are laughing. They're like, why is that a big deal? And I was like, this was crazy. This was unheard of when mm. it was on TV in 1955. Mm-hmm. And your uh, Midwestern parents were watching it. It was yeah. sexual. It was, it was not something you were supposed to see. Mm. And now you look at it and you're like, he's just dancing, man. It's, it's not that big a deal. Fair. Yeah. I, I, um, Right. So what's normal changes, what people like changes. That's fairly. uh, And um, what I think for me, uh, just getting back to the sort of evolutionary angle on things, is impressive is the flexibility of the human mind. Right. And the. uh, You know, we live in a social context like people our our evolution has to be considered like the social environment is as important if not more important to our survival i think you were making this point earlier than the physical environment you know what's most likely to kill you probably another human or 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 those cheeseburgers or whatever i mean yeah um but uh but it's a social you know it seems to me the social environment and, and that's probably why we're so focused on it yeah, we're at a point where the majority of reasons people were killed in the past was something they couldn't control. And now I feel like, you know, you've seen movies where they shoot rockets into space and destroy the asteroids. And maybe yeah. that could happen. Maybe it couldn't. I don't really know. I'm kind of skeptical. but Yeah, yeah. I am too. <laughs> maybe. But it seems like we would at least know something was going to happen. I guess yeah. maybe they can't really predict volcano eruptions. I think they can measure and they can tell something's going on. Like I, even my understanding was Mount St. Helens. I knew something was up because they were cutting size, uh, you know. Even in 1980? Yeah. Yeah? Wow. In fact, I think they warned a lot of people. It's just the holdouts that didn't want to leave that mm-hmm. really were in danger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To me, it just seems like we have, we've made so much technological progress that the thing that is going to get us is uh, a virus maybe i mean uh sure uh like i don't know that it will be one thing either so so it could be that a virus changes things i mean we saw you know covid was world it had a big impact um and if you just look at the numbers and i don't want to sound flippant here a lot of people died. Mm-hmm. A lot of people's lives were altered and a lot of people's lives were ruined. As a percentage of the population, it was probably a lot smaller than what happened with the Spanish flu 100 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so where I'm going with that statement is not that, oh, we've figured everything out, but it seems to me that our ability to respond to it was better. Mm-hmm. Well, to me, that's the cool thing about science is that we think we know everything but science says this is what we know right now and we're constantly studying and we're constantly trying to figure it out Mm -hmm. you go back and look at uh i believe it was the 1840s when not that they discovered fossils but when they started using the term dinosaur Mm -hmm. so dinosaurs essentially didn't exist before 1840 right ish yeah. This country was founded. George Washington didn't know what a dinosaur was. That seems insane. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? And it, my guess is there many people had seen dinosaur bones. They just didn't appreciate what they were. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's really, that to me is a really interesting thing. Um, I saw a paper by, I think it was um, Nico Salunius, but I don't remember exactly. It was about um, 
a paleontological site uh, in northern Greece where there's a lot of elephant bones. And he had this idea that perhaps that's where they got the idea of a cyclops as a giant with one eye. Because if you've ever seen an elephant skull, it kind of looks like a human skull. It's tall. Um, and if you take the tusks away, right? But it's got the nose hole is like right where our eyes would be. So it's got like one big hole in the middle of its head. So his hypothesis is that maybe early Greeks saw this and thought, hey, there's this big monster or whatever. It was a perfectly logical conclusion. It wasn't right, but um, maybe he's wrong. Who knows? I'm not trying to say that that's the right interpretation. But yeah, I think it's really interesting to, to see a thing, but then recognize the significance of it. And um, the, the fossil, you know, and for, for a long time after those initial discovery of fossils, or I shouldn't say discovery, appreciation mm -hmm. of them, was are these things still around somewhere? Because, you know, the, the people were ignorant enough of, of, and there was enough terra incognita that, you know, maybe there's a, and, uh, you know, this thing is still around. And uh, I seem to remember, in fact, Jefferson suggested that Lewis and Clark look out for mastodons <laughs> while they were out there. Like, keep an eye out for them, not look out for like they're going to get you, but like, hey, if you spot one of these things, let me know mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but I think it was in Stephen Ambrose's book or something mm. like that. Um, anyway, um, the uh, right. So then appreciating, wow, one of the things that the discovery of dinosaurs really, or I should say the appreciation of them showed was extinction is a thing. Mm hmm because there was this idea nothing could go extinct. Well, there's also this idea that we know everything and that we understand the world. Oh, we do, yeah. And <laughs> no, within 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we could completely discover that everything we think is true is not true. Absolutely. And that scares some people, but it makes me really excited. Yeah. That we're going to we're going to find out some crazy stuff. True. I think that's inevitable and I think not that it will change every, like I don't know what it'll change. I don't know what it'll be. But I think that's right. Think about it. there was a time when people thought, oh, yeah, you know, we're going to figure everything out that there is to know. But, um, you know, as we that's a very silly thing to think, um, in my opinion. Like, you know, one of the things I feel like is is the more I know this is such a trope, I hate to say, it, but I re the, the more that I that I learn, the more I appreciate how ignorant I am. And uh, that means you're growing. That's good. And just there's so much to and, and things that I. There's, this, there's an expression that I like very much, which I read in an archaeology textbook when I was a college student. And it, I can't remember who the quote, it doesn't matter. It just goes something like this. It's not what you don't know that hurts you. It's what you know that just ain't so. Mm -hmm. And it gets at, you know, you're like, you think you know something. And maybe you do, maybe you don't. And it's being really being willing to reevaluate what you think you know. Yeah. I think that's a very good mantra for life. You can you can believe in things, but you need to be willing to change that belief if something different comes along cuz we really don't know anything. We figured some stuff out, but that yeah. doesn't mean it's 100% true. And understanding why is also another matter. So, appreciating that uh, you know, Newton's laws or whatever you can you can predict the path of an object. That doesn't mean you can understand why. Yeah. Like why do why are masses attracted to one another? I don't know. I'm not a physicist. I don't know if physicists know why or not. <laughs> yeah. But um, they, you know, I don't know. But uh, or why um, I don't know why why we're here at all. But that's a good place to. <laughs> well that's that's the big one um, and that's I mean I don't know if we'll ever figure it out I can't imagine it's but possible I don't know if that would be a good thing honestly don't know either I think the fact that it's unknown and people can because if you told if Jesus came down and was like hey what's up guys this is it yeah bad things would happen every religion that wasn't christianity would freak out i have to imagine that's true yeah yeah and i mean it would go for 
any religion, if somebody came down, they're like, this is the thing. That would be insane. People, there are certain beliefs that people adhere to and you, you follow them long enough. They become a part of your core. They become mm -hmm. a part of your being. It's like being a, a Green Bay Packers fan or something. You, that's part of your identity. Yeah. And I've talked about this before. I was married for eight or 10 years and we got divorced. And the reason it wrecked me so much is because I didn't know who I was. Mm. I was a husband. I was a father. I was a homeowner. I was the guy who mowed the lawn on Saturdays. Yeah. And then I didn't have, I still had my kids, but when I didn't have any of that other stuff, it wrecked me. Huh. And I think that would be the same way if I was like super religious and going to mass and saying saying prayers every night and then I found out that it wasn't true. Yeah. That would be too much. Well, you know, that's so so this is an interesting thing. And I, I like to think about this a lot. I'm not talking about like uh willingness to critically evaluate your own assumptions about the world. So one of the things I think is really interesting is um I'm, this is gonna sound like a crazy tangent, but I promise you it has a point. And um, Herodotus is this Greek historian writing about the war with the Persians. But he talks about all kinds of other stuff. One of the things he talks about is the, um, the Nile. And the, at the time, he claims that the Egyptians had records of how much sediment was deposited every year during the annual flood in the Delta. And he works out a rate and he calculates, he says, well, let's imagine that the not what is now the Nile Valley was once a bay like the Red Sea is. How long would it take the Nile River to fill it with sediment to create the Nile Valley that we know today um, at the, if those rates were the same in the past? And he, he says, oh, about 100,000 years. Did you think about this? This is some somebody living at a time where there's no idea how old the earth was and he's willing to just throw out numbers like a hundred thousand years it's just because they didn't throw him in jail <laughs> yeah i mean it's just you know and i just think it's interesting he's just like well this this if you do the math this is what you get and uh or um you, you know you can think about um the idea that you know you're uh, there's another um person, uh, Nicholas Stino, who uh, in the 16th century was a physician. Anyway, uh, somebody brings him a shark skull and he sees these shark teeth and he looks at him, he studies them. And he realizes there's these, this is in Tuscany in Italy. And he's, he, they, the people in that area would sell or had, would dig up fossil shark's teeth and sell them as curi curiosities. Just, I think they called them tongue stones or something like this. And he realizes, wait a minute, this tongue stone looks not just kind of like a shark's tooth, but exactly like a shark's tooth in every detail that he was able to determine. So he says, well, I don't know what he says, but the next thing is, what does this mean? How can there be a shark tooth embedded in rock in the hills way above the ocean? And not just one, but enough that people find them on a fairly regular basis. And he's, from this, he works out, well, either the ocean was higher or the ground was lower. One of those two, and this must have been the bottom of, an, of a sea because sharks only occur in seas. And he thinks, well, uh, because the tooth still looks like a tooth, how do, you can't get one solid inside of another. You can't do that. So one of those two solid things must not have been solid. So uh, the tooth is still looks like a tooth, so it probably was solid, so it must have been this, this material around it. And so he's like, well, what's at the bottom of a sea? Mud. So it's probably, right? So he basically works out, and he wasn't the first, and I think others had worked out that that's how fossilization works, but what he puts together from that is some of the basic ideas of geology that... Um, what was once the bottom of the sea was then buried by something else, which was then buried by something else. So he's thinking, okay, 
this thing had to exist before that thing, which had to exist before that thing. So this must be older than that. And it's really, you know, if you think about like, this is a person raised in pretty serious uh, religious dogma of mm -hmm. what the world was like, how old it was. And he's here talking about oceans that are, you know, ancient. And it, to me, that's a willingness to critically evaluate your assumptions mm -hmm. about the world. Yeah, that's one of a kind person back then. Yeah, I, I can't imagine what the, the thought process was of anything yeah, over I, 300 years ago. <laughs> it was a different place. Yeah. I just I don't think that's what makes me question what we know now is because, I mean, even just germ theory, mm -hmm. washing your hands. Mm -hmm. They didn't know about that before 1860s. Well, in microscopes. Yeah. Yeah. Be able to see really small things. Yeah. Uh, well, that's another thing, um, which I think is, yeah, really interesting to me is growth and development. You know, how does your, if you imagine, well, not imagine, just think about, you know, that from the perspective of someone who doesn't have a microscope. <laughs> yeah. It just, how does your body know to end up there? It's. And honestly, we've worked out pieces of it. I don't think we're anywhere near all of it. Um, you know, genes are part of it, but they're part of a system. They don't occur in a vacuum. Yeah. And, you know, there's more There's more to it than genes. Genes are the molecular... They're the instructions to build the building blocks. And there may be parts of... The, like, I'm not a geneticist or a molecular biologist, but... Um, there are parts of that, like they, they understand how genes turn into pro, you know, code for proteins and how some ways in which they are regulated and switched on and off and emphasized or de-emphasized and timed. But even all of that isn't enough to explain everything. And I'm not trying to say that there's, some, I, there's just, um, for example, why can some organisms regrow limbs and others can't? You've, it, it's not... Um, and there's a lot of interesting stuff with pattern formation that suggests that there's more to it than, than just DNA. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, and I'm not trying to imply that there's some spiritual force there at all. I'm, I believe there is a biomechanistic explanation for how it works. It's a belief, um, not, a, not a proven thing. Um, but at but, its it's, root, but it, I'm trying to get it. It's more complicated. That's all. At its root, it's all some form of evolution. Absolutely. I, that I, that I, that I have seen nothing that contradicts that statement. Yeah. It's all things happening in the background with the goal of living. Well, the way I would put it is the things that didn't have that goal aren't around anymore. <laughs> they got second place or, or maybe they won. <laughs> Their goal was to not live. They're like, ah, I'm out of here. But we win. Yeah. You know, look, I, at least, you know, from my from from my perspective, I, I think that that's a fair statement. I, you know, like I said, evolution's goal is this. I'm not saying that that should be life's goal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. Like, uh, I what I what I will say just th th interestingly uh, is, I think there's a the amount of ev the amount of evidence for evolution is so tremendous. I can't wrap my head around it. Everything from molecular biology, developmental biology, comparative anatomy, paleontology, geology, um, things that, that are uh, domestic animals and, and, and people direct obser observation of real evolution in the wild, measuring evolutionary change in humans today along things like lactose tolerance and so forth, um, or disease uh, and other things too. Um, is so overwhelming and there's that that um it has convinced me that facts are not how you win arguments yeah not usually or or and and i don't even know that we should try to win our like winning arguments doesn't interest me that much yeah um and so i think about we can think about so many things vaccines uh climate change where the data are here and they are, they are, you know, 
There may be some things that we don't understand that are wrong or incorrect, but the general theme is pretty clear. Now, if you're somebody who doesn't accept that, there's no amount of new facts are going to change that. Yeah. And there's a really great illustration of this. Um, there's a paper written by somebody named Provine in the 70s. It was about genetics, and it was about something very important in American history, which is anti-miscegenation laws. You know what miscegenation is? No, I've never heard There's of it. Uh, where people from different races have children together. Okay. And people in the U.S. were really worried about this in the 19th century and early 20th century. So in the U.S., mo the, the, the opinion of the field of genetics was that crossing... Uh, people of different ancestries, was a bad thing. And they felt that there was genetic incompatibilities between their uh, genomes that mm. would make the offspring less suitable for life, less adapted, not as, not as fully human, not as, as, as so-called people who are purely one ancestry group or another. And this view was in line with another popular movement at the time of eugenics and so forth. Um, and it was probably the dominant view of most geneticists in the United States and much of Europe throughout the early 20th century. Hmm. By 1950, the opinion had completely reversed. That uh, there's, no, there's no genetic problem with doing this. There's nothing different about these people from any other people. And if anything, studies of other species have shown us that hybrids are often vigorous. So, uh, you know, when you look at dogs, you know, mutts are often healthier than purebreds. Mm -hmm. So they issue a statement in the, in the UN, in 1951, basically saying, there is, this is fine. <laughs> There's nothing, the field of genetics has decided that, um, I think they called it uh, interracial uh, you know, mixing it's, it's there's no genetic pro reason that this is bad. In fact, it's fine. So why why did opinion change 180 degrees in 20 years? No new studies had been done. There's no new data on human uh, crossing, if you will, or miscegenation. What happened was World War II, hmm. and people saw the logical extension of eugenics. And it just, what it shows you is that the social context is what changes, changed the minds of these scientists in 20 years. And some of it was probably holdouts dying off and new people coming into the field. But a lot of it was people were so horrified at what had happened that the social context changed minds, not data. Hmm. Well, and also the greatest indicator of what's going to work is just time mm -hmm. yeah if your body is less than you're gonna die or at least have some problems yeah yeah well and it's so interesting because um in the 19th century there are a lot of physicians and other scientists who would write papers in scientific journals um predicting that African Americans would disappear because they felt they, in their opinion, they they were just they would not be able to compete with the rest of society. Hmm. I mean, uh, a lot of this was just you know racist society reacting to the change mm -hmm. that happened after the Civil War and the in the. Um, and, but nothing, I mean, clearly false. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think we recorded it. I think it was before we started, but time will tell. There's going to be a lot of things we do now and we accept that in 50, 100 years, people are just going to be amazed that that was even possible. Yeah. And I think, I think what that shows is that people's biases affect their, what they see and what they expect. And scientists are biased just like the rest of society. Mm -hmm. It's like the old, I think it's probably a Gould saying, I don't know, Stephen Jay Gould. But, you know, 
baseball has a race problem because America has a race problem, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? There, it's not that there's something special about baseball. It's just that it's part of America and the rest of America is that same way. Yeah, I don't know why. I don't know why you would uh, be opposed to hearing a different opinion. It makes me think of Graham Hancock. And do you know who Graham Hancock is? I don't. Okay. Uh, he is an author uh, who has been writing for a long time about a theory of a, um, a an ancient civilization that achieved a level of technology that we can't understand. Okay. And he's got a series on Netflix called Ancient Apocalypse. Okay. And he is ridiculed by the scientific community as a heretic, as like a crazy person, because okay. he proposes these theories about an ice age that wiped out an ancient civilization. And even if he's wrong, the reason that you wouldn't listen to what he has to say and like consider it mm. is crazy to me. Well, it depends. Uh, you know, I don't know this person. I don't know anything about his ideas. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, what I can tell you is in throughout much of the late 19th, early 20th century, there were a lot of ideas about other civilizations or powers or whatever. And this is, again, sort of getting out of my wheelhouse here. But often Europeans and Americans who were in these places just couldn't accept that somebody from a so-called inferior society could have accomplished this thing. Mm -hmm. And so the better explanation was there must be a lost civilization that did it in their mind. Yeah. When the simpler one is, well, probably the people that lived here did it. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the reaction from the scientific community could be that, like, we've been down this road before. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, to make something science, we need a testable hypothesis. We need data that doesn't have other simpler explanations. It's sort of how I deal with, personally, I, I used to get a fair amount of questions about Sasquatch. And, you know, I'm not opposed to the idea of there being a Sasquatch, but we need evidence to accept that it exists. Yeah. And as far as you know, you're saying there's no evidence. That I'm aware of. And, you know, if it is a biological organism, it needs to do things like reproduce, grow, defecate. So there should be Sasquatch poop. Uh, Never mind finding the Sasquatch. All you need to find is a because you can get DNA out of fecal matter. Uh-huh. So you just need a little grain of Sasquatch poop somewhere. Well, also, you'd think there'd be fossils. The, the only, air quote, evidence that Sasquatch exists is like a grainy video from the 70s. Right. That's right. There, there'd be fossils or something somewhere. Well, and somebody hit one on a highway. Yeah. Or somebody, and there have to be enough of them that they can find mates and reproduce. Mm-hmm. And there needs to be enough, a big enough nutritional base. Like large-bodied primates take a lot of food. Mm-hmm. Um, so there'd be a carcass somewhere. Or there'd be, um, like I said, poop somewhere. There would be babies that die. Yeah. There would be um, a bear that catches one. Mm-hmm. There would be, you know, people used to find footprints, you know, um, there's a People sometimes would show up with, you know, impressions, casts, mm-hmm. they would make of footprints. And that's all fine. But, you know, to me, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Well, I think that's the thing about where we're at now. You, you used to be able to fake things. You can't fake anything anymore. With DNA and cameras yeah. everywhere, you're... Say, right, and somebody, somebody would set up a camera trap somewhere yeah. that would catch it. Yeah. Um, and so... To me, until somebody finds one or finds some poop with D- with Sasquatch DNA or, you know, I, I'm going to say I, I don't think it's likely. Yeah. Um, and same th- I would feel the same way, like, you know, are there, have we been visited by extraterrestrials? Personally, I love the idea, but that doesn't make it true. And there's no, to me, there is no irrefutable evidence that such a thing had happened. And the vastness of the universe makes you, me wonder, like, how would they get here? You don't think the government could cover it up? Maybe they could, maybe they couldn't. I don't know, but I think it would be really hard in the day of cell phones and uh, everybody's got a camera. Everybody's a a news agency these days. Yeah. 
Okay, well, one last thing before before we wrap this up. Yeah. I was talking about it recently. Why do you think we haven't been to the moon since the 70s? We went there 12 times, yeah. or no, maybe it was six times 12 people. Six times, I believe, yeah. Six times 12 people, all Americans, all men, yeah. between 69 and I think 74. Sounds right to me. Why haven't we gone back? Well, uh, I know nothing about... Uh, the politics of space exploration, other than like I'm all for going to other places, uh, just because I'm in general in favor of science and doing things like that. Uh, why haven't we? My guess is we've had other budgetary priorities. Um, I'm actually more wondering like why haven't other organizations like the European Space Agency or, or the Russians, or the, yeah, or China or yeah, some other ambitious uh, society. Like I can kind of understand how the U.S. might say. You know, we did that already. When you think about also, I don't know how to believe it, like think about the cost of education has been going up faster than the rate of inflation for for my whole lifetime. I, my guess is the cost of space travel, contra what most people will tell you, you know, at least government sponsored space travel has been going up fat. You know, when you look at my guess is it would cost a phenomenal amount of money. It just seems like it would be cheaper now than it was in the 70s. It should be, but it, I wonder if it what if it is. When you consider like building a bridge now costs a lot more than it used to in the 70s. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if it's kind of more like that. Mm -hmm. They just know all the mistakes they made and they don't want to repeat them. Maybe I don't know. I mean, I mean, look, I'm all for going. I think it, I think we would learn a ton. I think they should. I think go. it would be great, and it seems like a lot easier on the astronauts than going to Mars or somewhere like that, mm -hmm. where you're talking, you know, uh, I don't know, look, this is not, this is nothing I know anything about, but. Uh, <laughs> Just a personal opinion. Yeah, I mean, could we spend that money better? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And I, I personally also am a huge fan of these unmanned, uh, un, unpersoned rovers. Yeah. I think those are so amazing yeah, and so cool. interesting yeah. and, uh, Maybe we should be sending more of those to the moon. Yeah. Um, or maybe not. Maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we shouldn't defile it any more than it already has. Yeah, I don't that's know. the other thing. What if we screw it up somehow? We probably will. We screw up the moon, we're in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I I think it, we could learn a lot with some, and they'd be a lot of, but I'm sure they have a process for deciding what their pr priorities are yeah. and what would be scientifically the most interesting. Mm -hmm. And I certainly wouldn't know what that would be. <laughs> We'll stick to evolution. Yeah, there we go. Uh, that that is more, you know. And and to me, um, anyway, uh, I think that's my phone. I think that is. Well, that's a good spot. All right. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate I enjoyed it. talking with you very much. Awesome. Thank you for having me.